Welcome to Carousel. I'm your host, Marcel Soviero, and tonight we're going to hop on the carousel and talk to interesting people about interesting things. Tonight I'm delighted to have Dr. Thomas Anastasio as our guest. Dr. Anastasio is an artist whose work is on public display all across the United States, including in the Smithsonian, the Nassau Space Museum, and the Museum of Arts and Sciences. Welcome. We're glad you could be here. Thank you. Um, so why don't we start at the beginning? Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about your influences as an artist, and then we'll get more into your technique and, and so forth. But how did it all begin? When did you know you were going to be an artist? Uh, well, knowing when I was going to be an artist was something uh, I would say after high school, because I didn't have one Clear. art education. <laughs> being in college, high school engineering uh, wow. prep, I had no preparation at all for being an artist, but wow. I was, wanted to be. But however, as soon as I picked up a pencil, I was drawing. Okay. And I can remember back to the early 50s, there was a show called Wonderama, probably a little bit before your time. Anyway, uh, on that show was a 15-minute was a artistic segment with John Nagy, okay. who did it in a total volunteer basis. And he said, if you can draw a cube, cylinder, cone, and sphere, you can draw anything. So I believed it. So I practiced, practiced. I would practice for weeks at a time. Wow. And he would show you how to do landscapes and different things. And I picked up on it. And it, um, uh, I was drawing very young, and I happened to perfect everything he was teaching. And wow. uh, then I happened to meet, uh, I went to a parochial school, so I happened to meet a, a nun in fifth grade who uh, furthered my education interest, in the she, yeah. she was a dancer and artist and she really sparked my interest wow. and uh, I was doing murals for her all over the school in fact even some 25 years later I went back to visit her and she actually uh, had these pictures up even to that day oh wow so I was quite That's pleased exciting. Yeah. so are yeah. you completely self-taught then or did you eventually go no into, I wound up uh, going to art school I for to art, art school yeah right yeah. okay very interesting yeah. what well I was you... I was college engineer I was in uh, college engineering and then I met a, believe it or not, an English professor who, who sparked, who knew I was talented, saw some of my work, and invited me to a particular college, and I wow. attended. Wow. And it was great. That changed my whole great. life. Yeah. yeah, it changed your whole, yeah. certainly from engineering to being an artist is yeah. uh, sort of opposite sides of the brain. Well, there were, there were some family discussions on that. Yeah, I bet. with scholarships <laughs> involved and things like that. I bet. Um, so tell us a little bit about, um, I've read a lot of your background, and I know yeah. your grandmother had some influence on your work yes, as, yes. as you went on. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Okay, well, when I was very young, um, I can remember her telling me stories about uh, the Amalfi Coast mm -hmm. and Tr uh, Atrani, a, a small town just outside of yeah. Amalfi, and telling me about, of course, all these photographs were all black and white. Uh, uh, she was born here. My great-grandmother was born there. Okay. But she happened to go back. She went back and forth. Uh, in those days, <clears throat> turn of the century, roughly 18, um, 1880s, 1890s. Right. So um, she was telling me stories uh, about the, you know, the azure blue skies and mm. water reflections and everything. But of course, I had a black and white image in my mind from what I had seen. But she had sparked all this color in my in my brain, and she was telling me stories about things that happened to her when she was younger, what it was like to live in the city, live in a farm, and so on, how it was like at the turn of the century, the Bella Polk time, it, that right. was even going on in Italy where she lived. Right, you know, right. So they, they enjoyed a kind of a culture. It wasn't just a fishing town. Right. Um, Amalfi was, was a banking town years ago, mm -hmm. so it, uh, it was like a mini Venice right. of that area. Anyway. But all th this was all through her stories. You had this not seen it. This was all through her it. stories. No, I so had not seen it. So she brought this color into so it. So later, late in later years, of course, uh, married my wife, and we went over to Italy, and we spent a lot of time over there. Mm. Uh, in fact, we're lucky we have a house over there now, which we visit periodically. But anyway, um, getting back to that, I'm going to segue a little bit. I think this might be interesting. I also heard a story from her, um, which leads to my historical understanding of things and my avid interest in historical facts and science. She, w she told me uh, about, uh, the, the family had a farm mm -hmm. uh, in northern Fairfield, and they also lived in Easton, and they would take the produce down to Bridgeport. They, they had a little produce store um, down near what you would know as Seaside Park or the University of Bridgeport area. Mm -hmm. Well, she told me about a guy that used to come in her store with a beard and a, a, a white beard and long hair. Uh, he'd give her a nickel and pat her on the head, and, you know, and so on, and talk to her every so often. And of course, during the 50s, uh, Wild Bill Hickok and 
you know, all those, uh, all, all of the um, cowboy series, you know, Gene right. Autry and those. So I had a lot of pictures of me with little six guns and everything else. <laughs> and so she would tell me these embellished stories and um, of this man that met with her and talked with her and how this lady came in who used to shoot and was, was a sharpshooter and so on. So I didn't think too much about that until many years later. Uh, Bernard Riley, Bud Riley, was a well-known artist in this area. In fact, he, he, he did the, the archival uh, 1976 bicentennial mural mm -hmm. um, at the Bridgeport Burroughs Library, the archival okay. library. And while he was doing his research, I was helping him. I photographed him while he was doing We were good friends. And uh, I happened to discover that the gentleman I'm talking about was Buffalo Bill in the Wild West show. But now anecdotal to that, and I realized much later that what she was teaching me was what he had done for the American Indians by not only bringing the Wild West show. It wasn't just the Wild West show. It was a show that brought in culture of the uh, the culture a of the Indian, culture. a different yeah. culture, mm -hmm. and gave the uh, the Red Man a, a respect that they hadn't had before. So all of this yeah. hurt. It sounds like. Clearly, your grandmother was a storyteller, and that uh, she was. that inspires yes. all of us in some way. Yeah. And she was visual in her telling, and I can yes, imagine she was. that. So you took some of those themes from the Amalfi Coast, mm -hmm. um, and perhaps some from the West. I don't know. Does that play into your? I art would say at all uh, as well? Western Western education helped out a lot. Three-dimensional development. And yeah. so over time, you developed a philosophy, mm -hmm. as well as we'll talk in a, in a minute about your entire process that is your own, that others mm -hmm. now um, work toward achieving. But tell us a little bit about your philosophy of art. Oh, OK. Um, I, uh, art, art, is a, art has a diverse uh, human uh, aspect to it. Uh, when you when you deal with uh, the ancients, let's say, mm -hmm. if you're dealing with um, Heratic or Mesopotamian writings, you know, mm -hmm. uh, or e Egyptian Heratic, uh, you're talking about uh, everyday life, history, history of its time, and so on. We're going back possibly 5,000 years, right. maybe longer. We, we're not sure yet. Anyway, uh, when you uh, deal with petroglyphs, especially aerial petroglyphs, as we see in South America, um, and other in Central America as well, and um, we uh, we uh, in cave paintings, let's say, like like the recently mm -hmm. discovered French cave paintings. Right, right. Uh, we're dealing with a more religious aspect, but however, they they all encompass one major theme, where by we we learn about science, uh, we learn about math, and history, all encompassed in one, and it seems to come out of that kind of thinking. As far as my own ideas go, mm -hmm. uh, dealing with painting, um, I look at painting um, as, a, as, a, uh, as an intuitive universal endeavor. So um, the spirit of painting to me is in the paint and the brush or the pencil, you know, whatever you're using as the media. Today it might even be a, a stylus for, for a, a, you know, a computer yeah. stylus. Yeah. And that's just as valid, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it's just as valid as anything else. And um, so the specifics of the painting sparks mm -hmm. something universal in exactly. the in the yeah. in the viewer. In yes. Some and and as you go on uh, in my own work, I look at like um, earth, wind, fire and you know everything that's around the universe um, and I try to encompass that in a whole in an mm -hmm. energetic you know universe of some type. Well, I think at this point we should step back and explain mm -hmm. that you are a multimedia artist. You have done a yes. lot of different things, frescoes, mm -hmm. sculpture, paintings, mm -hmm. Chinese, uh, Chinese yeah. art. Um, so do you have a specialty or are you um, uh, sort of Well, photography is a strong specialty. I forgot to mention and that. And painting is a, a strong specialty. I was okay. working, my father had photography as a hobby years and years ago. And when I was very young and I spent a good portion of my childhood in a dark room, and mm -hmm. exposed to cameras and wound up teaching and so on in, uh, in photography and meeting a lot of people in the field. Um, met people like Richard Avedon and Ansel Adams, quite a few others over my history. And um, so I would say that photography is very important as course. well as uh, 
I can draw three, personally, I can draw three dimensional. I used to do architectural illustrations, but it got kind of boring to me. I wanted to get into something more creative. Okay. So as I moved on, um, and the more travels I had made, I, I saw my style changing. Well, yeah. and, and what's so interesting about that, and of course, um, we're going to show a piece of your mm -hmm. work now, um, but you develop basically your own style, which you call mystical fusionism, yes. yeah. um, which is wonderful. And let me just show our audience an example, and then I'd like you to tell us about um, how this painting came to be, and oh, <laughs> whoop, there we go, a little hard to see, how's that? Um, There we go. So clearly there's vibrant color here and the piece is um, Falling Waters of Desire. Right? Falling Waters of Desire number, I think, seven. There, there's about 20. This is an ongoing series I've been doing for about 10 years. Really? And it's still okay. going. I, I have a, probably five series working at the same time. I usually really? I do about at any given time. Any you given have five? time. I, I, yeah, I have about five things I'm working on presently. Wow. So tell us about yeah. the theme behind this series and sure. how you actually come to well, do it. Well, uh, with this particular painting, I was I was at Yellowstone Park years ago. Okay. About uh, let's see, in the, in the probably 2000, I was at uh, maybe a little earlier than that. I was at Yellowstone Park and I was doing some sketching out there. Did a lot of uh, plein air painting. Uh, I like to use. Um, I usually grind down my own ink. Uh, I use Sumi inks, and I usually grind it down early in the morning. It calms me down, gets me ready. And um, uh, from there, I, I, will, I will do a series of black and white sketches. So I was doing um, the mountain ranges and so mm -hmm. on, you know, whatever I could see out there. And I, have, I came upon some waterfalls. And uh, seeing this particular water pattern just really attracted me. I don't know why, but it just had an attraction. So I made a few sketches and I brought them back to my studio here in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I did was uh, I made a picture and a study in color from my memory. And it was on a large piece of paper. And I didn't know what to do with it. It was hanging around. I, I usually pin things up and I'll leave it for a while. Right. And I was working on a painting which I showed you earlier out in the yes. drawing room. Yes. And um, so I had that kind of suminagashi thing going. Okay. And so between the background and the foreground, I didn't quite know what to put together, but it was one of those mornings you get up and it's a total intuitive morning, okay? So I saw one picture, I saw another. Before you know it, it clicks. And then you have your visual. But now where do you go from there? So usually when I'm beginning something like this, um, it began, uh, if you want to hold yes, it up, I can point absolutely. to it, sure. Uh, I began with this painting back here. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the background. In the in the middle ground, I middle guess. Ground. And um, there is gold. There's gold on each layer. Now, what I do is I use sumi and um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Nihang. Uh, uh, wrong again. I use certain Asian papers. Okay. To get a translucency. Okay. So I'll do about five paintings at one time. Some of them are dipped in a suminagashi, which is kind of a water ink printmaking technique. Mm. I'll pull them up, let them dry and I'll overlap. So I have about five paintings going on. And a lot of times it's real. Now, the imagery starts from something real, but however, I deal with satellite photographs as well. Oh. So um, I've been working with NASA imagery since I was a kid. I was really interested in the Gemini program. Okay. Uh, I was writing uh, NASA when I was a young kid. I did a, I have tons of illustrations I did when I was a kid of all the missiles and God knows the Mercury program and everything. But how, how do you marry? We started with this in Yellowstone Park yeah, I know. and I'm, seeing I'm, water I'm getting, and now yeah, I know, with I'm the jumping. aerial views. Yeah. And, but somehow you bring it all together beautifully. Well, I, um, I worked with a synoptic view. If you will, synoptic viewpoint is basically if you think of an impressionistic painting mm -hmm. or a billboard. If you're, if you're far away from a billboard, you see a complete picture. But as you move close, you'll see the little Bende dots. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's right. a synoptic view of the uh, Earth, and things will flatten out. So as I look down and I see and I blow things up on my computer or whatever I'm using at the time, it could be photography, uh, I'll get certain ideas visually. But conceptually, I'm making sketches. I can make a lot of sketches, but since I'm a photographer as well, 
I usually do a lot of sketches in my head, and they'll be going on 24-7, mm -hmm. you know, and I, so I keep turning that around. So the background image came out of a series of topographic images that I saw, and then I layer them. In the, there's like five pictures going on, and those are usually cut into grids, and each layer gets a 22-karat gold layer. And then from there, the middle ground is, will be overlaid. And then you have the central image, mm -hmm. which would be this piece right here. And would that be the waterfall? And that would be the waterfall, yes. Oh, so wonderful. That, but it is integrated within the entire theme. So, and that's where falling waters comes from. And that's the falling yeah. water. So it's yeah. an interesting process. It starts with drawing something very mm -hmm. um, tactile. You come back and you start getting these aerial views and you pull things together. Now, is that what mystical fusionism is? Or well, um, yes and I'm no. Sure there's more yeah, to this, it. this is this is the visual version of what mystical fusionism is. Um, um, the, this this is also a time lapse situation. I've always been interested in, um, if you will, the still photograph. Mm -hmm. So, like you know, my bridge in discovering the flip book. Um, uh, I would say that um, uh, I've been interested in that futuristic view of things all the time. So uh, not having the money when I was a younger artist, mm -hmm. I did develop a technique called teleoptographics, which probably got me to uh, into New York and into my galleries. But basically, it was taking television images okay. and uh, silk screening them onto glass and plexiglass and having these images roll while they were there. Now, at the same time, Nam June Pike, who passed away about two years ago, was a video, an early video artist, okay. and I liked his work. I knew what he was doing, but I could never afford to buy what I see in this studio mm -hmm. at the time anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Starving artist, usually. Yep, yep. And so I'm working with a time-space sequence also in my work. Okay. Okay. Now, getting back to your question, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I segued. Um, that's you, okay. Yeah. We're talking about um, the uniqueness mm -hmm. of the mystical fusionism. Okay. And you've, you've sort of brought mm -hmm. us um, right. toward, well, toward well, it. Well, dealing with mystical fusionism, fusionism is actually a, a William F. Buckley, a local man. Um, Connecticut. A, a Connecticut. Okay. Uh, it's, that's, it's strictly an American political term, but fusion would be the joining or conjoining of energy to keep it simple. Right. Uh, but I added fusionism because it does touch on to, I don't like to get into politics, but it does touch on like uh, fusionism might be uh, the joining of conservative and uh, liberal thinking. Mm -hmm. And you have um, uh, libertarians today possibly. Mm -hmm. So that might be an idea there politically. But, but as fusionism far as our happens yeah, in fusionism many, many things. With food, I think there's fusionism. It does. It does. It happens. <laughs> I watched Rachel Ray this morning, and it happened. And she's doing it. And it was great, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking of trying that. Anyway, um, a mystical would be uh, in the religious, the, the religiosity. Um, and what I've drawn from my background in Catholicism, uh, Judeo-Christian background, um, uh, mm -hmm. and Asian Asian readings and Indian readings. You know, there's a lot of, I have a broad spectrum uh, going back to my childhood, and it just built on that. And right. I hadn't, I didn't realize that one day I would, uh, I would incorporate that into all my work because in the back of this is Hebrew poetry as well. In this picture, in this yep. picture is, is uh, there's writing back here, but to me the poetry that's in the background, that's on one of the layers, um, will come out and disappear, but it's kind of like looking at a sky. Mm -hmm. So we have a synoptic view looking down, but we also have one looking in the deep space. So sometimes we can't see the sun or the moon because of the clouds. Same thing with the poetry, the spirit's there. Wow. So the spirit energy is still there. Now is this something that idea. you, um, I know people follow your lead on mm -hmm. mystical fusionism. Tell us a little bit about your contemporaries and... and um, um, yeah, um, well, uh, dealing that that's something I noticed back back in the early 90s okay. uh, late 80s early 90s uh, before that uh, you know we had pop art and minimalism and so on I uh, thank God I got a chance to meet Andy Warhol and a lot of the artists I got to New York at just about the time that minimalism was in and photorealism were in okay. so uh, I actually had my first one-man show at the Mizell Gallery okay. uh, which is on Prince Street yep. and then went down to the Ward Nass and uh, we're right around the corner from O.K. Harris. So the heart of the new art field outside of the abstract expressionist, 
which was up in the village. The, the new art center was off Prince Street and West Broadway. So I happened to be in some good circles at a very early age. I right. got, just got there right on time, it That's seemed. It. You know. Um, anyway, so uh, being down there and being exposed to all these artists and talking with everybody and everybody's coming in and visiting shows and we're all talking, I, I would say that uh, I began to notice something happening around the early 90s, like I said. Uh, during the 80s, it was kind of a, um, a potpourri of styles, but kind of graffiti-oriented with Keith Haring and Basquiat, mm -hmm. you know. Um, the the uh, street paintings were in. Uh, that wasn't what I was doing. I had a lot of writing in my work. I've always had writing or yes, poetry in my work. Yeah. Um, even Gibran's work is in my, yeah. is, is in integrated. I'm doing a series on that right now, too. Right. Um, that's going to take another five years. God wills. Anyway, uh, but anyway. Uh, uh, so you were saying in the 90s. In the 90s, I began to notice that at uh, strategic galleries, uh, like, like the Dillon Gallery, the Ward Nass, the, fir the first gallery, a Russian-oriented gallery, there were artists there. Um, even the Iron Gallery uh, um, had uh, Asian artists, Japanese Sino artists, American artists, Russian artists, Romanian, Pakistani, there's a whole potpourri of artists that were, you know, into integrating gold, some Asian styles mixed in, hmm. and so on. That's clearly in, all, in a lot of your work. Yeah. yeah, and it's clearly in even modern, the expressionistic artists. Um, because what I noticed happening was that uh, we were all doing the same thing. There was some kind of spirit going on, which is Eastern, of course. In, in the concept of things, you know, in the old days, they would, they, uh, in the old days in China, the, the um, Taoist and the, the literati would paint, and they would, if they wanted to paint a mountain, they'd go to the top, come back down, paint, go back up, look at the middle of the mountain, right, paint, and, and then paint the bottom, you know, right, so right. it was all conceptual. Well, a lot of the art of the 60s and 70s was conceptual, it came out of the mind, came out of thoughts. Uh, reactions and so on. So I saw these, uh, we were all doing roughly the same thing. Mm. And um, so I believe it's some school that just hasn't been announced yet, but uh, with, with having said that, uh, I noticed that there was a group of Nihanga artists. Now they have kept themselves separate, but during the 90s we had a Heisei group, which is uh, Japanese, American, um, and uh, they paint in kind of an American uh, Japan, Japanese style, style okay. but related to the gem understanding of, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the use of screen painting. And in the old days, they would grind down semi-precious stones. In my work, I grind down all the, uh, I grind down pearl, mother of pearl, I grind down rubies, mm. um, uh, different gemstones, which add a luminosity to the color. Absolutely. And it's impregnated with special glues I get from Japan. <laughs> and so um, that's, that, that's what adds that little bit of luminosity, which goes back to a Nihanga base, but it also goes back to uh, screen painting. Now, mm -hmm. the thing I noticed was we always hear about East-West, especially in the Impressionist style, right. whereby, you know, Hirosuke Hokusai uh, affected the Impressionist, post-Impressionist, right, right. and what we have is modern. The however, though, is it looked more like a West-East impression because during the 50s, this is something I found out later, that during the 1950s um, uh, there was a scholarship program going on with Chinese nationals to come over to America and attend colleges mm -hmm. and they brought over their knowledge of, of uh, painting but they were turned on with the Parisian schools so wow. they began to copy that. Mm -hmm. And and yeah. and today, um, I was reading how you have been a um, contest judge and an expert oh. on on certain. I don't know if it's a contest or um, uh, Chinese and and different. I can see where all of your influences are very varied, and your expertise seems in lots of different yeah. places. Um, but so how when you're teaching or judging, how, how, what, how do you best sort of convey everything you've told us tonight to a student who's just beginning in all oh. of this? Uh, very good question. Uh, I would say, first of all, perseverance. You must persevere, no matter what you do, perseverance. Mm -hmm. But don't take yourself so seriously either. If, you, uh, if, you're, if you're a student uh, studying the arts today, 
uh, I would say everything is open to you. Uh, well, you are an example of that. It's not an easy field. Right. It's not an, I, I could tell you right now, it's not an easy field. Right. I've had my ups and downs over the years. Uh, sometimes you feel like giving up, but other times you say, well, gee, it's, it's working, right. you know, and uh, you just keep going at it. And I was lucky to have met a lot of great people in my yeah. time. So what I'm saying is persevere, don't take yourself too seriously. And I think that's a good thing to say to a, to a younger young person college student. To getting, getting attempting, started. Yeah. As far as judging, when I'm judging, I'm very objective. Yeah. And I think, I think all judges have a responsibility. Uh, I mean, to I be judge, objective, certainly. To be objective mm -hmm. and to judge from a, a professional standpoint, right. not because it's real or abstract. There's good real, there's good abstract. Right. You know, and that's something that's, it's not just in the eye of the beholder. Mm -hmm. uh, science is science, art's a science. Art is art's a, a science, foreign language. absolutely. Art's a you language, know, we're a gonna, visual. We are going to have to wrap yeah. up, so sure. I want you to tell us where you're going. What is possibly next for you with all of this? Well, I'm working with a group of people in Florida. We're, we're trying to protect the turtles, so I'm working on a conceptual project wow. for that. Um, I, did, I did work with the Rauschenberg Foundation, and just a few years back, um, we, we completed the 2030 um, uh, virtual reality program with my college students. Wow. So uh, we designed a complete uh, 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 Martian, if you will, Plymouth plantation on Mars. How we're going to think, how you would act and dance, religion, science, and everything. And that you, was transformed. That's you, on the internet. You, have, you and, opened the uh, mind. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, you well, just make me think about a lot of different things. The Renaissance never stopped. It, well, clearly. It's, just, it's been going on since probably right. before Leonardo. I think he was typical. He was an exception, but I think he was also typical. Well, that's, we're going to have to wrap up, but yeah. that's, that's a uh, Well, it's a been nice my pleasure. Thing. We really appreciate having you on the show. Thank you. Good night. You too. Thank you again.